The gondolas, the Bridge of Sighs, the Grand Canal, the Doge's Palace, St. Mark's Basilica. Venice has achieved mastery in the art of putting on a show. It's not easy to distinguish in this inventory where the greatest masterpieces are the set for so many romantic cliches, what is real from what isn't, what is genuine from what is phony. One thing is certain, the Venetians are children of the lagoon. Without the sea and the boats, they would never have invented the dazzling world that was the Republic of Venice. And it is no doubt for this reason that the launch of a new cruise ship is such an important event. To crown the event, the godmother of this huge white ship is the most famous Italian actress, Sofia Loren. What better dream ambassadors for the cruise? Well, it's wonderful because, I mean, you can go, uh, you choose the place where you want to go and discover, and uh, you choose the trip that you want to do. I think it's absolutely incredible for a family to be able to stay all together and to see so many wonderful places and discover so many wonderful places in the world. When I came in and I saw the ship, I mean, it was in absolutely incredible. Accompagnata dalla comandante Ferdinando Ponti, signore e signori, Sofia Lorena. I'm somebody who is, uh, is very anxious. Uh, I feel always the importance of the moment and uh, I get very emotional about it, yes. I do. Preparatevi perché questo è un momento molto importante. Be prepared, everybody. Si! Venice awakens. The Piazza San Marco has the elegance of a theater. A few hours before the curtain rises, people are busy putting up the set. These men and women who are starting work are a bit like actors getting ready to go on stage. Beyond the theater set, there is a real city. Not very far from Piazza San Marco, just over a few bridges and down a couple of tiny streets, you can feel the heartbeat of Venice.
At the Rialto market, the usual customers come to buy fish that arrives fresh every morning from Chioggia, the lagoon's port. But this other Venice loses a few of its inhabitants each year. They move to Padua, Mestre, and the new housing complexes on dry land. But they return to Venice every morning to go to work, always stopping on their way to have the indispensable coffee. Piazza San Marco, the first spectators have arrived. The show can begin. Venice likes to admire herself in the mirror of the past. She can't stop wanting to look like the 18th century city painted by Guardi and Canaletto, a sparkling city where life seems as light as the clouds or the wind over the lagoon. Not easy to preserve a heritage that is so hard to grasp. Ever since it first opened, the Café Florian was known as a sort of cultural café because the sculptor, Canova, was an intimate friend of the owners. They had been childhood friends, schoolmates. Their friendship set the tone. The café became a meeting place for artists. I think the atmosphere must have made it quite avant-garde, a place where one would have heard about all the newest trends that were emerging at the time in a city like Venice. It was here, for example, that women were first allowed inside a café. They could come and have coffee here, while it was still forbidden everywhere else in the city and in all of Italy and Europe. In Venice, new ideas circulate fast just like the merchandise that used to arrive from the four corners of the known world. In the Byzantine era, Venice imported precious spices and coffee from the Orient. When coffee first arrived in Venice in 1683, it was considered to be a medicinal plant. Incredible stories started going around about coffee. It was said that in Istanbul, it had rendered the woman lascivious and had caused men to lose their virility. The Café Florian had opened in 1720. A century later in Venice, there were 311 such establishments, that is, one café for every 500 inhabitants. To understand the history of the privileged relations between Venice and the Orient, one needs to take a look at the history of the Mediterranean. At its peak, the Roman Empire extended from Western Europe to Asia Minor and to North Africa. As a consequence of the barbarian invasions of Western Europe, the empire withdrew to the Orient, making Constantinople its new capital. Under the leadership of the newly Christianized sovereigns, what by then had become the Byzantine Empire expanded. They colonized Italy, and especially Venice. But the empire declined due to the Ottoman expansion. Both heirs of Byzantium, Venice and Constantinople, would make war on each other, but always continued commercial relations. From the 12th to the 18th century, Venice was one of the great Mediterranean powers, but with no ambition for territorial hegemony, since Venice's strength lay in commerce and diplomacy. Even during the times of direct confrontation, like the Battle of Lepanto, where the Venetian fleet crushed the Turkish fleet, 
never did Venetians stop commercial trade with the Turks. In 1621, they opened trading counters on the Grand Canal. As of the 12th century, three Moorish brothers from the Peloponnese opened the way by coming to the Canareggio Quarter. How did a city the size of Venice manage to compete with the other major powers of the time? The secret lies there, behind those long brick walls. The Doge's Palace and the Basilica of San Marco represent the political and religious dimensions of the Serenissima, but the secret of its power was its shipyard. In this shipyard, which occupied 10% of the city, were built the thousands of galleys and merchant ships that sailed the Mediterranean, bringing back the riches of the Orient. You have to imagine the myriads of people working in this place. An incredible number of craftsmen were employed at the shipyard. Of course, the most important were the carpenters. Then there were the joiners, the ore builders, the mast builders, the blacksmith, the metal casters. All the trades were represented, down to the humble craft of masonry. At the shipyard, for probably the first time in the world, two of the craft were reserved for women, sail making and rope making. There was a spinning mill where twine was made into ropes for the riggings of the ships. You have to imagine that the shipyard was like an ant colony where everything was organized for a single purpose, the construction of a galley. Of all the boats that were constructed here, there was one that was utterly exceptional, the Busson Tour. The Busentor was a very particular galley. Its top half was modified to accommodate a great many people. The last Busentor had almost 2,000 decorative wood carvings covered in gold leaf. The Doge and his illustrious guests embarked on this very special ship for the Ascension Day celebration that included a half-religious, half-pagan ceremony. During this ceremony, which took place close to the Lido port, the Doge would throw a ring into the water, thus becoming wedded to the sea, symbolized by Neptune. This was a way of giving thanks to the sea for Venice's prosperity. Thanks to its commercial activity, Venice pushed its horizon and its borders well beyond the lagoon. Venice became the crossroads of the world. The facades of the palaces that line the Grand Canal are a sign of its commercial and cultural prosperity.
Until the beginning of the 9th century, Venice was under Byzantine domination. The Greek saint Theodore was patron saint of the city at that time. In 828, two merchants brought back from Alexandria the body of Saint Mark, the evangelist, who became the new patron saint. This change symbolized Venice's emancipation from Byzantium and marked its new identity as a Western state. But the Serenissima would never forget its oriental roots, which are so apparent in the structure of the Basilica San Marco. The Gothic churches are the archetype of Western belief. A main aisle spans the entire nave, all the way from the entrance to the altar. It is a symbol of the long road everyone must travel to reach God. In the Byzantine, Greek and Oriental model, the churches have five domes that symbolize the divinity. They guarantee the presence of God at every stage of a Christian's life. You enter, you're here. To the right, to the left, in any direction, God is everywhere above you. In a certain manner, you have already reached him, because he always loves you and because he is always above you. The Venetians sought inspiration from the style developed in Byzantium and hoped to equal the high level of Byzantine achievement. The mosaics were made by Byzantine masters. When the engineers and Greek architects came to build the church, they brought the Byzantine mosaic artists with them. Since traveling was neither easy nor rapid at the time, the artists also brought along their families and their ateliers. So they settled in Venice and were able to transmit their techniques to Venetian artists. This is how, in the space of 150 years, a great number of mosaic workshops developed in Venice. Under the influence of Byzantine masters, the iconography that embellishes the domes is pure classical Byzantine workmanship. It is by looking up at the interior of the domes that we can admire the oldest mosaics. For centuries, artists would continue the work of their predecessors by covering the walls of the basilica in mosaics. From its Byzantine simplicity to its Baroque exuberance, this monumental work expresses the permanence of the Oriental influence on Venice. Leaving Venice, the Musica begins its inaugural cruise. In 
It slowly descends the Giudecca, while its passengers enjoy the long, majestic panorama of one of the world's most beautiful cities. Leaving the lagoon, the musica soon reaches the sea. Destination, Bari and southern Italy. On their way to Bari, the passengers discover their floating hotel, a sort of voyage within a voyage. We are approaching Bari. This is one of the major ports of the Adriatic. It is the base for the ferries that connect Italy with Greece or Croatia. In the Middle Ages, Bari was already a booming city of sailors and merchants. Two centuries after Venice had received the remains of St. Mark, the sailors of Bari stole the relics of St. Nicholas from Mira in southern Turkey. Having become the city's patron saint, the veneration of St. Nicholas rapidly spread beyond the Italian borders. In Bari, like in the rest of the world, St. Nicholas has always been connected with sailors and merchants. All the great maritime and fluvial cities chose St. Nicholas as their patron saint. This is the case with the great cities situated along the Rhine or the Danube. In the great maritime cities as well as inland cities, you can often find St. Nicholas on the market square, or else a church that is dedicated to St. Nicholas. The collapse of the Byzantine Empire opened the south of Italy to other conquerors. Bari thus became a Norman possession in 1071. Destined to receive the relics of the city's patron saint, the Basilica of St. Nicholas, with its very plain facade, is one of the most beautiful examples of the Romanesque style in southern Italy. After the Normans, the entire city fell into the hands of the Swab, 
who built strong fortifications. Then came the Angevins and the Aragonian invasions. After three or four centuries of successive occupations, what is left of the Byzantine era? It was at the beginning of the 15th century that Venetian art began to supplant Byzantine art. Nevertheless, we notice that even though there are very few architectural signs of Byzantine presence here, on the iconographic level, there is no mistaking that Byzantium left a deep mark on the region. Leaving Bari, we set our course southwest towards Turkey. Seven hundred miles, or about eleven hundred kilometers beyond Bari, we approach Izmir. In ancient times, it was called Smyrna. Today, Izmir is the biggest Turkish port on the Aegean Sea. Greco-Roman period, a great number of colonies flourished along the shores of the Aegean Sea. Of all those cities, Ephesus was probably the most powerful and the most prosperous. The founding of Ephesus goes back to the dawn of time. After several centuries of Lydian, Persian, and Greek occupation, it was under the Romans that this little town became one of the greatest cities in classical antiquity. The golden age of the Roman Empire began in the second century. At that time, the city's population reached 200,000. This population was made up mainly of commoners. There were also aristocrats, slaves and merchants. Many of them came from various lands to the east of Anatolia. It was for this reason that many different languages were spoken here in Ephesus, and that many different religions were practiced. The city had always been a bridge between the Orient and the West. We know that most of the merchandise, the raw materials that were imported to the West along the Silk Route, all of those products passed through here. The Library of Celsius, with its double row of Corinthian columns, is one of the most beautiful buildings in Ephesus. It is the reminder of the prosperity of the city during the second century of our era. At that time, Ephesus was located directly on the sea, its great port was the key to its prosperity. But the alluvial deposits carried by the river progressively caused the shoreline to recede and ultimately filled the port with silt. Little by little, Ephesus disappeared under the sediment. It was only during the second half of the 19th century that excavations revealed the impressive extent of the site.
With the Aegean coast of Turkey on the starboard side, we head north. This route will take the Musica to its final destination, Istanbul. During the night, we have crossed the Dardanelles Straits and passed into the Sea of Marmara. The Princess Islands are visible ahead. We're approaching Istanbul. The moment we've been waiting for finally arrives. On the promontory, the silhouettes of the Blue Mosque and St. Sophia come into view. There is Byzantium, there is Constantinople, this is Istanbul. On both banks of the Bosporus, one foot in Europe, the other in Asia, the legendary city of Istanbul will always be the mythic door to the Orient for travelers. To feel the pulse of this city, one has to go to the Galata Bridge. This bridge spanning the river called the Golden Horn is the transportation hub. Cars, pedestrians, and boats are everywhere. The huge population explosion means that the two suspension bridges linking Europe and Asia are no longer sufficient. To handle the masses of workers crossing the Bosporus each day, the number and the size of the ferries keeps increasing. Meanwhile, awaiting the completion of the undersea subway, where else in the world do a city's inhabitants cross from one continent to the other by boat every morning to go to work? Too vast to be governed, eaten away by barbarian invasions, the Roman Empire was on the verge of collapse. In 324, Constantine decided to found a new capital on the banks of the Bosporus. This new Rome would become Constantinople, the city of Constantine. During the following centuries, Constantinople never stopped becoming more beautiful, more dazzling. After the Romans, the Byzantines fortified the city which then consisted only of a portion of the western bank of the Bosporus. When Rome fell to the barbarians in 476, Constantinople was the only capital of what had become a Christian empire.
For nearly eight centuries, the Byzantine Empire would be a bastion of Christianity in the Orient and a barrier to the barbarians and later to the rise of Islam. The reign of Justinian marked the golden age of Byzantium. The Basilica of St. Sophia is its greatest masterpiece. When the Emperor Justinian came to power, he wanted this church to be the greatest church of his time. He ordered an enormous dome to be built for St. Sophia, and he wanted it to be the largest in the world. St. Sophia's dome is unique. Nowhere in the world is there anything like it. For the Ottomans who conquered Constantinople, this dome became a reference, and especially for Sinan, the most brilliant of the Ottoman architects. Sinan was greatly influenced by Saint Sophia. He tried to reproduce it when he was put in charge of building his greatest mosques. Unstable foundations, earthquakes, fires, the basilica that Sinan discovered in the 16th century had gone through a lot. But most unforgivable was its pillaging by the Crusaders in 1204. By comparison should be emphasized the benevolent disposition of Sultan Mehmet the Conqueror when he took Constantinople. When the Sultan Mehmet the Conqueror came to Saint Sophia for the first time, he was extremely impressed by its marvelous architecture. He didn't want it to be destroyed. He wanted it left intact and transformed into a mosque. Most of the materials used in the construction of St. Sophia, especially the marble columns, came from Egypt, Ephesus, and other cities of the empire. The marble walls came from Prokanesos, Naxos, and Paros, where the marble quarries are. Justinian wanted Saint Sophia to symbolize the unification of the world. In that era, one could still believe it was possible. A high gallery runs completely around the central nave. This is the gymnasium, the section reserved for women. The most beautiful mosaics are situated in this part of the building, like that of the Dasis mosaic, also known as the mosaic of prayer. Christ, the Virgin, and Saint John the Baptist are depicted in gold leaf. Even beyond the technical prowess, what is so admirable here is the realism in the treatment of the faces. Beyond their religious significance, the St. Sophia mosaics are an open book illustrating the clothes, jewelry, hairstyles, and actual faces of the Byzantine sovereigns. Istanbul is a synthesis of Byzantium, Constantinople, and the Istanbul of today. Saint Sophia represents this synthesis very well. That's why it is the symbol of the city.
Saint Sophia has watched over the city for almost 1,500 years. 15 centuries in which the caravans brought all the treasures of Central Asia and the Arabian Peninsula. Jewelry, carpets, and other ornamental objects such as chests and silks embroidered with gold. The workshops of the Great Bazaar produced all of these things. The Venetians bought such goods here, then took them back to Italy to resell them at a huge profit. Today, cargo ships and ferries have replaced feluccas and schooners. At the time of the Silk Route, or of trade with Venice, the waters of the Bosphorus were the center of an incredible traffic for all kinds of sailing ships. Along the banks were a succession of palaces, forts like Rumeli Hisar, constructed by Sultan Mehmet II in 1452, only one year before the fall of Constantinople. Here we also discover the Yalis, traditional wooden homes that today are the pride and joy of the more wealthy inhabitants of Istanbul. Most of the time, the Venetian merchants were also diplomats. Thanks to the archives, we know that Venetian relations with other powers like Austria and Spain were on a monetary basis. They practiced a sort of monetary diplomacy. This played an important role in the Ottoman Empire. Venice allowed the empire commercial and diplomatic access to Europe and the West. We mustn't forget that at one time, during the Renaissance, the diplomatic language was Italian. 
because Tuscany was the dominating power. Without denying the Venetian influence and the omnipresent Byzantine style, many masterpieces were also produced in Constantinople under the Ottomans, beginning with the elegant Blue Mosque. With cascades of harmonious domes and six minarets, the Blue Mosque is a work of the late period. Built in the beginning of the 17th century, when the power of the Ottoman Empire was rapidly declining, it was inspired by a model elaborated 150 years earlier by the incomparable Sinan. To have a better idea of the elegance and diversity of Ottoman architecture, one needs to go inside the Topkapi Palace Museum, which for 400 years was the political center and the government seat of the Ottoman Empire. In its organization, in its design, this palace reflects the very structure of the Ottoman Empire. The first part is given over to the state, the all-encompassing state and the imperial council. The second part is the doorway to happiness, with the harems, the imperial schools reserved for the heirs to the throne, and the reception hall where ambassadors were introduced to the court. The palace also reflects the Turkish military organization. But what most emanates from the Topkapi is what one might call 
a magnificent modesty. If cafes were the literary clubs in the fashionable spots of 18th century Venice, in Constantinople they were a part of everyday life. Today, in Istanbul, the café associated with the Nagile is still part of the art of living. I've been coming here for a long time. I smoke a water pipe, I drink coffee, and I talk to my friends about all sorts of things, like politics, football, or the problems in Turkey. I come here every day because I love to see my friends. I need this. I can't do without it. It's my way of life. As for coffee, it's the same. I can't live without it. 